Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, this is the last session today on uh, the last track uh, on the topic of the future API stack. And we're very privileged to have four fantastic speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce the first one without any further ado. So please welcome Hugo. Hugo is the uh, API and message development advocate at, at Red Hat. I'm sure we all know Red Hat. Um, Hugo is going to talk to us about getting started with event-driven APIs. So well, welcome, Hugo. Thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you one of the big shifts that we have now currently happening around APIs. OK, um, let's uh, get started with this session. And first, some introductions. As, um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Hugo. I'm the developer advocate for APIs and messaging within Red Hat. Perhaps you know us more for Linux and Kubernetes with OpenShift, but we also have a big um, uh, set of portfolio around uh, application services and API. Perhaps you know TreeScale and, and such. And I'm uh, streaming live from uh, New England in the United States. Um, I would love to be in London, but you know, still uh, not able to travel uh, as freely as we as we used to. Um, I leave here some uh, contact information if you want to continue the conversation. Uh, here's my Twitter, and there's also my email. And you can read some of the articles that we have been publishing around um, event-driven architecture, APIs, and messaging uh, at developers.redhat.com. Now, what we will be talking today in the following minutes, it's related to what modern applications are requiring from um, developers and APIs. We will be doing a quick introduction on event-driven architecture. If you haven't really uh, played with that, we will be setting some of the ground so we can then talk about event-driven APIs and how this um, way to approach to uh, asynchronous reactive uh, type of, uh, of uh, inter interaction between services and, and application works. So on the uh, modern applications, what we have been seeing, it's obviously this big shift from the uh, classic architecture based on three layers, monolithic type of systems to these new enlightened postmodernism, you know, this abstract new kind of art that sometimes gets a little bit confusing. So you certainly will uh, have seen this kind of movement, right? From your old architecture, running everything on the application server um, with all your, uh, uh, your uh, WAR files or your ER files deployed in a single place where you have uh, this uh, abstracted infrastructure. And then moving into this new world of microservices of uh, applications that need to be uh, distributed and uh, across different regions, need to be decoupled and need to be uh, resilient. So when we are trying to do this kind of uh, shift between one, uh, one side to another, sometimes we as architects and developers feel like this, right? Like we are just one single guy, one single person trying to tackle this um, legacy system, this kind of architecture by our own. And, and sometimes it is very difficult and very appealing. Uh, we can get some help and, and, and we certainly the way to uh, to start uh, building it, it's you know going by parts, and this is because most of the times what we have seen with uh, our customers and what we have seen around in the field is that the legacy applications or the uh, overall application um, landscape that uh, are that are uh, in any traditional organization it's a little bit more complex than just one single application. Most of the times we have existing applications that might be, you know, these fast monoliths built, built on Java E or Spring MBC. Um, and then we have seen that there has been uh, some modernization of these applications moving from the existing to new applications going to, you know, single contained applications like Tomcat or Spring Boot or even moving into microservices architecture with, uh, with Spring or reactive uh, systems perhaps some more JavaScript in your landscape. And maybe you have been in the cutting edge and now implementing something around serverless, a function as a service. Um, so most of the times, you know, the landscape is complicated and, and, and it gets, uh, gets, gets a little bit challenging. And let's take this example. Uh, you have this new retail application that needs to 
you know, uh, present different types of things, the pricing engine, the review system, you need to connect to the specification from the manufacturing, uh, the location uh, inventory, and, and also some recommendations on, on, on what people have been uh, buying in, in the past. So if uh, suddenly you need to realize that you need to build this kind of application, you find that if you want to do it with microservices and you know this new enlightened postmodernism architecture, it will be hard, right? It will be, you know, it will take some time. And this is mainly because microservices are by itself hard. Because we are talking about microservices and distributed um, applications and distributed systems. And those are inherently hard um, because you cannot rely on the um and infrastructure as we used to have when we have these, uh, you know, tandem systems running forever and never, never being shut down. Uh, suddenly, we know that AWS can fail, and suddenly we can get DNS um, uh, shortage and and get um, really complicated um, uh, system degradation, topology changes, and and this is one of the things that we need to tackle with uh, uh, distributed applications, and. When we are working around this, and suddenly we uh, decide to use, you know, direct communication using REST HTTP API, we can see like the right side where we see this um, image from NetEase on, on their services connecting to each other. And if uh, you haven't really uh, gone through the experience and you're trying to start that, you might be able to uh, face challenges like the uh, challenge, like the chaining of uh, microservices. So if you're building, remember this, um, this uh, uh, application for mobile that consumes uh, mi different microservices, and suddenly you need to you know, first do know how to do discovery for, for your sessions and how to do the routing so now that you know where how to connect or where your services are located. But also you need to start to handle more and more things like retries and, and timeout. And this is because if you uh, follow this, this graph and suddenly one of your systems uh, crashes and or collapses, um, it might lead to a, a, a cascade falling for all these services and then uh, providing you a bad, your user bad experience. So uh, to avoid this uh, or handle these partial, partial failures, there are different techniques when res using REST HTTP APIs. And if you go that rabbit hole, you will find that there's really a plethora of things that you need to address or you need to you know, add to your architecture and your systems to be able to handle those kind of things. Have you heard about service mesh? Have you heard about, you know, um, um, bulk heading or uh, have you heard about um, circuit breakers and, and routing and, and shallow traffic and AB and green and canaries and all those kind of things. But what we have in seeing is that when sometimes we start to, you know, throw all these kind of things into our architecture, it really looks like this. So at the end, when you you know put everything on top of that, it really looks like you fix it, but you know it's it's kind of you still see that there's something missing. There's there's a part that doesn't belong to the rest of the architecture. So uh, it is because HTTP it is easy, but sometimes it is limited. So HTTP as a protocol by itself has limited uh, default tolerance. Uh, it is um, mostly for request response, has no buffering. And so when sometimes we see that, we see that with microservice, we need dumb pipes and smart endpoints and, and, and this kind of, uh, of, of, of views of the architecture. Um, it, it is well suited for some use cases, but sometimes there are other use cases where, need, where we really need not so dumb pipes. So we really need to have a way to handle this type of connectivity in a more smart way. And this is where event-driven architecture comes into the, uh, into the game. So let's talk about uh, one example. If you go to a coffee shop and you want to you know, order a coffee or a tea, for example, then you go with the cashier and the cashier will certainly take your order and will ask you your name. And why is it this? Because after they take their, your order, they will pass that order to the barista. And the barista will then prepare your coffee and then you are able to remove away from the queue and then you know, continue doing whatever you, 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 you were doing before or you just can hang, hang around. And then 
when your coffee is ready, you then can you then will be called by the name you give you, you gave to the cashier, and then you will be able to you know go and pick up your uh, your coffee at the moment that it is it is ready. If you, uh, for example, need to wait in the line and uh, with after the cashier just you know uh, goes to the back end, prepare your coffee, and then get back, you will get a, a bigger and bigger uh, queue, and more if it's in it's in early morning. So. Uh, the idea of having this decouple system when the cashier does a specific thing and then the barista does the other thing allows you to, you know, decouple on time, being able to scale. You can have several baristas attending or you can just have one or many cashiers depending on, on how complicated it gets. So then why are we talking about event driven architecture? Well, as we have seen in this example, event driven architecture and um, and asynchronous communication mirrors the real world when we want to achieve for efficiency. It also helps us reduce coupling and not only coupling by uh, technology, like you know, different languages communicating with each other because of the protocol, but also decoupling in time. So this means that suddenly when we have a application that is producing a ton of events, um, we can have then um, those events in store uh, for a certain amount of time until then the uh, the consumer of those events of the uh, destination or the, or the target for for our events are available and then are able to consume. If both systems are available at the same time, well, you can you can just pass uh, along the message and then you have uh, like uh, synchronous communication. But if not, then you can do that. And also, it opens a, a lot of kind of, uh, of of consumption patterns where perhaps the application that um, was not existing even before when uh, before your, your uh, after your uh, events were produced so you have uh, scaling you have uh, near uh, real time latency because you are receiving events of their uh, um, happening so this opens a very interesting set of use cases right from um, uh, behavior capture that was the uh, for example the original uh, use case for creating apache kafka where LinkedIn was tracking what was uh, what was all these clicks happening in their system. You can have um, complex event processing where you can um, see patterns on, on on events or things that are happening in your system. You can also do CQRS for uh, decoupling the uh, read and writes from your application. You can do event sourcing. You can do auditing. There are different interesting things to uh, to go with uh, with EDA or event driven architecture. And this is because there is a different way to handle the communication between services. As I, we, I was mentioning on traditional REST HTTP APIs, we used to have this um, request response, right? We have the, uh, the client then the server receiving the communication and then sending the reply back. In the case of the right side, it's, uh, uh, in a synchronous type of communication, you have the what we call the producer, the client then trying to send some information and we have this middle piece of, uh, of architecture called uh, usually the broker or the event boss where you will be able to handle the communication and the traffic um, to the uh, to the different consumers so this is the the, the, the main uh, shift in the uh, in the way to handle this kind of uh, of apis and as it was mentioned from the consumption partners there are Three different, so when you are talking about events or changes that are happening in your system, you will certainly face one of these three uh, consumptions. So the first one are the uh, volatile events. So those events that uh, need to be captured in the moment. And if they're not captured in the moment, it's more like a synchronous communication, then perhaps they lose their value or, or they are not affecting the uh, outcome of your, of your computation. Um, if there is like, you know, average of, of things like that. Then we have the traditional durable events, the more um, commonly associated with brokers and messaging systems where you send information to the, uh, to the broker, to the system, and then it, it, it handles the delivery to a specific consumer, so set of consumers depending on the uh, semantics of the communication. And then finally, we, we have this uh, third use case or third consumption pattern based on the durable events it, that we call the replayable events. So the replayable events are uh, similar to durable events, but with the benefit of storing in the long term those events and then allowing the consumers to re-receive all the events that happen in a certain amount of time or a certain period of time in the same order and in the same way they were originally received. 
So this is interesting, for example, when you need to reprocess information, when you just, uh, you're doing, you know, AI or ML and you want to retrain your models and you want to, you know, um, uh, change the uh, the model and then replay again all the events as they happen and then see the different outcomes of your uh, of, of your work. And for that, this is what we have this uh, this component of the broker that is able to handle the communication between the consumers and the producers. And for even driven architecture, we have actually different protocols to handle this type of communication. So in REST API, APIs, we just mainly uh, rely heavily on HTTP. But uh, EDA, it, it has been evolving also for a long time, and there are different type of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of protocols, MQP, STOM, MQTT, Kafka, and certainly a lot of those are also uh, HTTP related, like WebSockets, webhooks, and such. And even driven APIs are really a small part on the, on, on the right side, lower side, or of, a bigger, um, of, of a bigger architecture that covers data pipelines. So when starting with even driven APIs, it's important to focus on the contracts. You know, one of the important things of APIs is this I that means interface or, or, or contract. So that's what we really want to talk with uh, to, on, on when designing even driven APIs. That's the difference between traditional messaging and uh, the new even driven APIs, the, this ability of contracts. Because in the rest world, we know that it works, right? So we have the specification, perhaps open API, we have designers and we have mocking. Now, in the case of even driven APIs, we also have this uh, specification uh, to define how our um, our broker is available, how to connect, what are different types of, uh, of uh, topics or channels that we are able to connect, what is the structure of our messages. It is heavily influenced by the open API. And this helps us to make it more easier to uh, get a start. So Sync API is a very interesting way to start uh, looking at, at the synchronous, at even driven APIs and synchronous communication. Because the Sync API, you know, first it's protocol agnostic, so it's easy to, you know, um, apply that for our normal broker where you are using, you know, MQB, MQB, MQTT, uh, Kafka. WebSocket, GMS, and such. And a Sync API, it's not just the specification, but they have other ground in being able to use, um, uh, have this playground, code generators, documentation, editors, mocking, testing, even by um, by uh, additional uh, third-party providers like, like Red Hat. So the idea is to have this unified view of contracts where we can get something that it's gonna be handling registers, uh, registrations and, and on the register endpoint, and then also being able to, you know, meet events on each one of those registrations. Because at the end, the business object that we are handling, it's the same from the uh, from the business perspective. So we, if we do a deep dive in the anatomy of the Sync API, what we will see is that it's very, very similar to what we have on uh, Open API. We have some metadata information, uh, how to connect to host and security, the channel, the operations, the message structure, and the payload that we will be receiving in each one of those channels. So how do you get started with a Sync API? Well, you can get started with uh, first doing your design. So if you're doing contract first approach, it's uh, where you can get, for example, with Apicurio. Apicurio is uh, this community um, mainly focused on APIs. They have a a live version studio that you can try even uh, for free and then get started with a, with a Sync API. It offers you a web form based editor as well as the uh, traditional editor. Um, if you want to take your design and then start doing some mockups for Kafka or for WebSockets or in the future, you can uh, go into the mocking phase of the of, of your cycle and then perhaps take a look at Microx which allows you to uh, write some examples in your specification, then being able to put them as mock servers without having you know to do the whole implementation of your service. If you really want to do your implementation, then I recommend you to get started with uh, Quarkus and even driven architecture. So Quarkus has uh, is this new lightweight framework for uh, Java that allows you to do native compilation that you know uses uh, a, a very small amount of memory and resources. So if you go to uh, to Quarkus code.quarkus.redhat.com, uh, you can search for Kafka, for example, of other reactive messaging to start 
uh, developing your uh, your clients or your consumers. So with Red Hat integration, we can get started with even driven APIs because uh, Red Hat integration includes uh, some components for even streaming processing, for creating pipelines, for even sourcing, even for change data capture. If you want to create some components based on the events happening in your database, so it's an interesting topic. We have a some some uh, some customers that are implementing this kind of thing. So in Europe, we have uh, Post Italiane. Their uh, eBank, uh, Elvetia, and such. And finally, I want to leave you some resources if you want to take a look on the information that I have shared today. It is uh, some of the interesting things you can uh, you can have around. So, Chris, thank you very much for the time. I think uh, we have uh, some questions. So yes, we, we have a couple of questions. So um, awesome. thank, you, Perfect. thank you very much, Hugo. Um, yes. Yeah, so the first question is: Why are webhooks needed in the event-driven API architecture? So um, as I was mentioned, a webhook is just a way to deliver event-driven architecture. Um, it is uh, a way on you receiving um, back some information or, or a call from, from a system. This is uh, one of the ways to implement based on limitations or well, uh, restrictions or requirements from your architecture. For example, you know I can just expose HTTP. And, and that's the other protocol that I'm able to handle then. Well, there's a way to, to work around that. So webhooks, uh, server side events are other um, of the things that we can use for uh, having this kind of behavior, the couple behavior where you you know have the service, uh, the server calling you instead of you starting to pull the information. Thank you. Um, I've got another question. How ready are large corporates, for example, banks, for event-driven architecture? Do they have both the tooling and the mindset? Um, what I have seen is that even driven architecture has been uh, in, in, in big corporations, financial services, for example, um, but it was more on the durable type of consumption where they use these uh, message queues, you know, uh, like IBM MQ or RabbitMQ to do their, their messaging. Um, also allowed for for um, for real time. What we have seen with these customers is that they are now expanding to different to other different type of uh, consumption patterns, and sometimes because of the uh, requirements um, where they used to have the uh, the EDA implemented, like you know transactions and and consistency and such, uh, sometimes makes it a little bit more complicated to expand their their view because. Sometimes, you know, things like Kafka does not support distributed transactions. They are eventual consistency. And, and that sometimes makes it difficult for some people that, you know, want to have these highly, you know, confident uh, uh, restrictions on, on, on the data. So what we have seen is that they are starting to, you know, go coming from outside and then, um, you know, satellite systems uh, working with this kind of approach to EDA and then keeping the, 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 the core on the traditional type of consumption. So it is important to, to actually understand what are the limitations of the different solutions. And that certainly helps to do this uh, mind change that will allow you to make it uh, uh, more easy to, to implement these uh, this solutions. I think we've got one, one, one more question. Um, is, is this the end of request? The request response model. No, 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 no. That that's one of the important things that I that I wanted to show with this unified view. Remember, uh, mm -hmm. I had a slide with has that had Open API and that had um, um, a synchronous API. What we are seeing is that both of them are requiring your architecture. You it's not like you are going to be replaced one with with another. It's depending on the consumption pattern, depending on what you really need to do and achieve. In your uh, business case, that's when you can then choose. It's not like you are going to be doing one or another. What we see is that there's a combination of both. And, and, and depending on the type of, of, of communication that you need to between your services, one will fit better than, than the other. Yes, you can do everything with just one type, you know, everything with REST APIs, everything with the event driven APIs. Yeah, but sometimes it will be complicated for certain implementations. So that's why we see both playing together. So that's why at uh, least from Red Hat, we have the uh, the view of a unified vision where you, you will be able to go to a developer portal and find REST APIs, even driven APIs, GraphQL APIs, everything around that. Fantastic. 
Well, listen, thank you very much, Hugo. It's been absolutely fascinating uh, listening to you and uh, we had, to ha had a couple of great questions. So thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.